um, nitrifiers. So they're actually, the most likely explanation is that this is bacterial chemoautotrophy and they're inhibited in the light and so you don't, you don't tend to see it in the light. But um, I don't think you're going to find this in any protocol. Uh, okay. You always see something, you almost always see something that looks like this. Surface inhibition, you know, a subsurface peak, and that's the optimum um, productivity. And then um, at, at depth, respiration exceeds the... Um, the rate of, of photosynthesis. Um, okay, so what does C14 measure? Uh, so what happens to a cell? You've got photosynthesis synthesis of compounds and respiration. And if you look at cell volume, and this is data from Heidi Sosick at her Martha's Vineyard Observatory, this is the light and this is the dark. What you can see is in the light, the cell gets bigger. So it's photosynthesizing and making cell, new cell constituents. And, and this is the mean of a population of Sinecococcus. So she's individually counting the Sinecococcus and measuring their scattering. And so you can see the cell is getting bigger. And then this is the average of the population. At night, the cell is dividing, but there is also some respiration which will cause a, a loss in the cell size. But in terms of thinking about what happens to that photosynthate, it's going into synthesis of cells. And the other thing, and this goes back to the bottle effect, um, if you take full strength seawater and measure um, the growth rate of phytoplankton, and if you dilute it, so you're diluting the grazers, you find that there's a difference in the, the apparent growth rate, and that's because this is um, the true growth rate, this is true growth rate minus grazing predation. And that, I throw that up there just as an example of one of the things that happens in a bottle. Okay, this is just showing people um, doing simulated um, in situ measurements. Do you think they've corrected? These are nickel screens. Do you think they corrected for the light? Probably not. So there's a specter of light the same at the surface that is depth. So they're simulating the depth by putting more nickel and less nickel on the outside of the bottles. So these incubations on depth, on deck, are not going to have the right spectra. So that's something to think about. I'm just going to skip this. OK, the third type of C14 measurement people do, these are photosynthetrons. And they put um, small vials in a light gradient. And so this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is a, a farm of um, P versus Z incubators. And the idea is to be able to get data points at a variety of light intensities for the light limiting part and for the light saturating part so that they can use this to model using Pmax the slope and um, the, the measured light intensity. So that's a common method. Um, this is just an example of the type of data that um, is derived from one of those incubators. Earlier I mentioned this EK, which is the light intensity at which the cells no longer are light limited. And this is based on a number of these P versus E experiments. You can see near the surface, that transition light intensity is very high and at depth, that's very low. So a cell that grows at depth is much more optimized to be able 
to make maximum use of that energy at low light. So this will be up here, meaning that for a high light environment, this value will be way up here. For a low light environment, this break point will be much lower. So the cells adapt by putting more pigments in the light harvester antenna. Yeah. What's the latest thinking on how all of this stuff depends on the time dependence of the irradiance? Because you, you put this in your little uh, lab experiment, it's a steady irradiance, and you, then you increase it and steady. But in the real world, these guys are sitting here near the surface getting flashed by wave focusing, so that most of the time it's a lower irradiance, and then they get blasted for like 10 milliseconds with this strong irradiance, and so the averages are the same, but it's a much different, really light environment. So does that right. affect all of this if it's flashing occasionally versus steady, even though the average is the same? I guess a couple of things. One, one is, do you ever see photo inhibition in the field? And very often, um, if the cells have been photo inhibited, you'll get a curve like this when you do this kind of measurement. If they haven't been photo inhibited, you will damage them in the incubator and you will see that. So there's kind of a thinking about, yes, you'll only see photo inhibition in, in an incubator if they haven't been photo inhibited. That's one response. Um, the, the other one, Kurt, is I don't know, Emmanuel, if any, if from that paper that you did with Ron, if anybody's used that to try to model photosynthesis in terms of the. No, but that, that the question I think is more physiological. Is how do they deal with a very high factor of energy if it comes? And I, I think Strauss here to that, but I'm not sure. Right, Colin. Wasn't it first wasn't it Kurt who said that the the who actually took. Susanna Roy, yeah. I've read some yeah. stuff with coral reefs of people looking at that effect on the dinoflagellates from the in, in reefs and shallow water reefs and seeing a large effect from that yeah. flashing, you know, focusing on light. On yeah. I think maybe what happened was people just realized that that's a second order problem. Like we still can't, we're still not getting gross productivity and net productivity well. Mm -hmm. and so those are second order problems, but they might turn out to be first order of magnitude. Yeah. And, and I think that, you know, we're near the surface, even if it's focusing and defocusing, the ambient light is so high that it might be, as Colin said, a second order as opposed to, yeah, Kiel? Elena Lichtman also has a few papers where she looks at the effect of intermittency in cultures of different kinds of things and finds that the total growth rate of the community doesn't matter when they do it in situ. Um, though some phytoplankton are affected their co-workers, but the community composition varies a lot. And mm -hmm. so there's like interesting community effects. Mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I, I think there's a difference in the response if the light is shifting in this region because it's mostly light saturated. I think the question Kurt's really asking is about the damage if the light yeah. is like way off of that scale. Um, there were a lot of, this is n not related to Kurt's question directly, but there were a lot of studies in the 80s where people tried to simulate moving phytoplankton as if in a vertical water column, and they found that if cells were moving, that it either increased the photosynthetic rate, uh, decreased the total water column photosynthetic rate, or didn't make a difference. So. <laughs> you had, your answer was yes, yes, and yes. 
And, you know, it all depended on, you know, who was doing it, how the simulations were set up, you know, what the species were, but it was Jim Yoder, was it? Uh, uh, Right. The time constant it's makes a huge difference. Yeah. Manual. Another thing is that what, in terms of modeling is when you look at these P versus E uh, curves, they're done with, let's assume they're done with fire plankton taken from one depth. These fire plankton would not necessarily, I mean, yes, through the day they, they migrate on that curve, but they would mostly spend their time probably in a certain range of that curve. And if you think about most modelers use a single P versus E curve for the whole water column when they do ecosystem modeling. They don't, they don't vary them with that, which means that the, the, there's an Uber curve that, that one would you, need to use, which covers, you know, for high light, you use that part of the curve. For low light, you're going to use the one adapted to low light. And it looks like none of the P curve from any one depth. If you use the right, right. in terms of the ecosystem model. Right. And so just looking at this, this tells you that there's an effect of depth because this is EK for this, and it's saying it ranges all the way from about 30 to 400. And Right. Right. And so you could either say, how do you get a difference in EK? So if this is EK, you could get it a difference by doing this. So these two are different. Or you could get a difference by doing this. You know, in, in the first case, the slopes are the same. In the second case, they're not. So this number doesn't constrain the problem. But Emmanuel makes a good point. I mean, when we were in the North Atlantic doing the North Atlantic Bloom experiment, we had a factor of, um, 25% in Pmax, and there was a shift. And we could not explain it based on temperature, salinity, nutrients, species composition. And so sometimes you can do the really great job that Emmanuel is saying you should, but then you get out into the ocean and you go, I haven't got a clue why this changed by 25%. So I think the approach is that you, you put confidence limits on it based on you know, best case, and that just increases your uncertainty, and the, 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 the editors don't like it, but um, and I think that's more honest. James and then Kale. For this experiment in particular, when were these bottle samples taken? Was it taken during like a mixing event, or was it taken during the stratified waters? Or I don't remember. <laughs> Sometimes. Sometimes. I'm seeing the error bars on that, so I'm assuming they kind of did it on the day, or maybe? Uh, this yeah. does not have error bars. This has error bars. And these are not. I have to go back and see if I can find out. Yeah, Kale, where I took it from. Given this drawing over here and the uh, fact that you've been using the sort of piecewise, piecewise curve for this, do you not like using Michaela's Mountain Kinetics for the light uptake? Um, I'm not sure what kind of curve that they used for that. I mean, there's like about three or four different models. It I okay. really, it doesn't matter what curve you use as long as you're consistent. Really. Yeah, I mean, it comes out with, yeah. you know, this is really good data. I mean, that's really good. I mean, I've seen far worse, 
I've done far worse. If you have big cells, it's usually horrible. Um, you get a lot of scatter. You know, it's sort of like which curve do you, which curve fitting method do you use? It's sort of like worrying about a detail that's very small compared to the variability that's in the data. Another thing, in, when you look at these global ecosystem models that people want to run for, you know, 10 years to look at climate change effects if you do one thing or another, a lot of those run the biology on the 24-hour averaged irradiance. And NASA, for example, one of their standard outputs is the 24-hour averaged par value. So you use that in your ecosystem model, and then you're sitting on this curve down at, say, 100, which is the 24-hour average irradiance, and the biology sits there growing for 24 hours a day at a low light level. Well, if you run your ecosystem model with a real PE curve and a diurnal variation, you know, you're moving up and down this curve, and the ecosystem evolution is much different. And when I kind of got into this business indirectly by trying to improve the light calculations, I was, even as a non-biologist, kind of blown away that people were saying, I can just use a 24-hour average irradiance and do my global ecosystem study as opposed to modeling light versus dark over a 24-hour cycle. And, you know, but that seems to be the state of the art. And the reasoning is, oh, well, these models take so much computer time. We have to just do everything so simply, and we can't afford to use a, you know, like a, a calculation every hour or two moving up and down the PE curve. We're just going to do like this one you know, our time step is one day, not one hour, when we run the model. And my argument to that is it doesn't matter how fast your computer program runs, if it puts out the wrong answer, <laughs> it's no good. It's not going to pay your money. And if it takes, you know, a, a two-hour time step to get the biology right, you've got to do a two-hour time step. You don't need to do five minutes, but you can't do 24 hours. Emmanuel. It's what Colin said before, if, if the response, if, it's not, if it were a linear curve, if you're always on a linear curve, using the average wouldn't matter. The problem is when you deal with nonlinear behaviors, is then you cannot simply use the average light to get the average of the synthesis. Right. So, so. It's really easy to parameterize, though. You know, I mean, you know, like, at a given latitude, what there is in this population, should be like, so you should, if you assume a sort of curve shape, you should be able to. So here's an example. So here's a P versus E curve that was taken on a ship. Here's the profile the of phytoplankton based on chlorophyll. Here's PAR over the 24 hours, and it's uh, averaged hourly in this case. Here's the productivity normalized to chlorophyll using PAR as an input. And then here's the productivity uh, corrected for the biomass. So this is the total productivity uh, over the course of a 24-hour period, in this case down to 80 meters. So that's what you were asking for, Kurt, for people to do in these models. And it really, you know, if you have the light, it doesn't, you know, it's not that big a deal. But I just wanted to show you um, that curve. So I know that this is, I'm going on a little bit longer, but I wanted to just go through a couple of examples, and I might go through them a little bit fast, but you have them as the handout, in terms of how do you measure net community production, and remember that's gross production minus everybody's respiration, phytoplankton and the heterotrophs. This is data based on oxygen concentration from Ken Johnson on a float, and the float, I'm trying to remember if it came up every five, days or yes. 10 days? This was every five. This is over, I managed to wipe out um, the course of two years. So he's looking at um, oxygen evolution over the summertime, wintertime's mixed layer event, um, development of oxygen um, sub associated with the deep chlorophyll maximum layer, winter mixing event, and then taking that um, data that was 2002 
to 2005, looking at the oxygen evolution in the summertime, reset by deep winter mixing, oxygen evolution in the summertime, reset by deep winter mixing. And from that, he computes rates, average rates in this area around Hawaii based on um, evolution of oxygen as an example of the net community production. A little bit finer detail was from this um, classic, to, and I'll say classic because I think it really is a classic, uh, 2008 experiment where we launched a Lagrangian mixed layer float, water following float, chased by four gliders near the old Jake Off site, and um, the float followed a patch of water. So it's making measurements of oxygen every five minutes, nitrate every 20 minutes. You can see from April 1st to the end of May, the evolution of a chlorophyll bloom at the surface, the same for backscatter, the same for beam attenuation. Nitrate is color-coded the reverse of what you would expect. So this is really showing nitrate drawdown. So where the phytoplankton concentration is the highest, the nitrate drawdown is the greatest. And here's the evolution of oxygen. Again, the high oxygen values associated with the phytoplankton bloom. So Matthew Alkire used um, nitrate and oxygen, nitrate drawdown and oxygen evolution to compare along the Lagrangian track of the float, the um, net community productivity and he used um, POC biomass. So everything was converted to POC. And then from backscatter and beam attenuation, he also had POC biomass. And the next slide shows the summary that the net community production from nitrate, which is in the red, from oxygen, which is in the black, are very similar. So this is based on evolution, corrected for air sea flux, and on consumption. Oxygen has a photosynthetic quotient applied to it. Nitrate has a red field ratio applied to it. And so those are uncertainties. And this is the POC accumulation based on beam transmission. So we have net community production we have accumulation of biomass, and the two don't agree. The difference between the two is export production. And on the order of 30 to 70 percent of the net community production is exported. So exporting the carbon, but leaving the signature of oxygen behind. And, and so that by looking at the two, you can come up with an estimate of the export flux. Again, this is from Nathan Briggs. One person's noise is another person's signal. How many of you, first thing you do is you, you spike everything? Right, you do spike it. Okay, well sometimes there's a pattern in spikes. And so we saw these pattern in spikes. And again, this is part of this North Atlantic Bloom experiment. Um, converted the spikes above a baseline and then put together a pattern, and this was part of <coughs> Nathan's master's thesis, you could actually see a pattern in this spikes. And we interpreted that as being part of sinking aggregates of diatoms. The silica went below one micromolar, and we started to see these spikes, and it was like a sinking front. Richard Lampett was out at the same time with the pellagra floating sediment traps, and he captured these spores of uh, diatom catosiris that Tatiana Reinierson reported in this paper. And so th this could be used for one component of the sinking flux, but then the, the reason that spores have this really resistant um, silica and um, cellulose um, frustule is, it makes them resistant. And so going through a diatom, um, a zooplankton gut, they're, they're resistant to that. So is this really part of sequestration flux? Trying to understand what are the things that are sinking out that may make it through the twilight zone. And this is using optics. And then the last example I'll show is we started seeing these crazy bulges 
and this isn't the best figure for this, but we started to see these crazy bulges in um, the CTD traces where with depth, if we saw, say, oxygen and, say, backscatter, we would see something like this at the surface, and then it would go down. And then at about 300 meters, we'd see something that looks like that. And it would have oxygen, chlorophyll, and, and backscatter. And the only way you can get something like that is you don't have sinking oxygen. You have to have, it's got to get down there by subduction. And so the third mechanism for export is at the edge of eddies, we see subduction of POC, uh, dissolved oxygen, and most likely uh, DOC. These are glider traces, and where these black lines show up are examples of these um, little bulges in oxygen and optics. So there's ways to get at um, using optics to get at some of these um, fluxes, and I think that um, I just wanted to, to stop with one equation, sort of equation, that the basis of productivity models are light, some estimate of phyto phytoplankton biomass, and if you remember back to the very first slide, what's the uncertainty associated with your estimate of phytoplankton biomass, and then photosynthetic coefficients, and these photosynthetic coefficients are going to come from most likely um, P versus E type calculations. And the models have proliferated, but the basics haven't changed. The basics require and this has satellite models, whatever kind of model, some kind of estimate of light, and it might be spectral, most likely not, some kind of estimate of a biomass coefficient, and it's most likely going to have to do with chlorophyll of some kind of flavor, and then some coefficients or transfer functions to, to convert and those will be normalized to biomass that will take light and translate that into some kind of rate of <coughs> primary productivity. So the question is, is it gross primary productivity? Is it net primary productivity? Are they really looking and not knowing it at net community productivity because they've got net community productivity in the bottle? And so I promised I would not get into the satellite models, but I wanted to go over what is photosynthesis, what are the types of productivity, and I'm going to leave you to solve the problem of what's the best model in terms of going from the satellite from space to the productivity in the water. That's enough. <laughs> Probably time to move. <laughs> James. I mean, that's why the approach that Emmanuel is taking and others in terms of trying to have something out there so that you can uh, come up with what is the euphotic zone depth, what's the mixing depth, because some of the models assume that you know what the mixed layer depth and you get them from the Navy models and how good are they. Um, you know, if you have a deep chlorophyll max, the getting the euphotic zone and the biomass at depth are more important than they are, say, in a place that's um, most, you have high biomass at the surface. So the answer is depends. <laughs> okay. I think you need to get air and coffee. Yeah.
Yeah, 10.30. Is good. 